Good evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is, and, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. If you pay attention to the debate over whether we should embrace hydraulic fracturing as a method of extracting natural gas from shale layers that undergird much of upstate New York, you might think the choice is between the riches of Saudi Arabia and the apocalyptic environmental allure of the Gowanus Canal, at least before Gowanus became a fashionable residential district. The New York State Department of Environmental Conservation is slogging through an unprecedented blizzard of comments on a supplemental generic environmental impact statement that, if the state decides to, to proceed with hydrofracking or fracking, as it's commonly called, will set the ground rules for the anticipated thousands of permits that could be issued. It was widely perceived that Governor Cuomo came into office a proponent of hydrofracking, seeing a bonanza of jobs and tax revenue for a financially strapped state. Landowners upstate have been signing land leases with gas, with gas companies that are potentially lucrative for both the companies and the landowners. But some towns and villages have moved to assert home rule and opt out of allowing the gas wells to be drilled within their boundaries. Cuomo has come under siege by many environmental activists and other fracking critics who cite extreme threats to groundwater supplies and air pollution and the unwillingness of the gas drilling companies to come clean about just what chemicals they're using to blast apart the underground shale and capture the released bubbles of gas. The one, the one can never be sure with a governor who plays everything very close to the vest. Cuomo might be having second thoughts, as, as he did not mention hydrofracking in his State of the State address and did not include any funds in his proposed budget for, for hiring the staff that would be needed if permits are finally authorized. The controversy carries with it global geopolitical implications. At a time of massive unrest in the Middle East, with much of our oil coming from questionable allies like Saudi Arabia or semi-enemies like Venezuela, and with apparent Iranian moves to develop nuclear weapons that could threaten a massive disruption in the international oil market, the argument for energy self-sufficiency has, for, for has, has, has moved center stage in our, in our national debates. President Obama gave what I believe was correctly interpreted as an expression of support for fracking in his litany of domestic energy production goals during his own State of the Union speech this winter. So what's a state to do? We're joined by four New Yorkers who take part in that debate. Michael Aronson is a member of the editorial board of the Daily News. Mark Liebman, uh, uh, Mark Liebman is, is an economist with economics, analytics, with, uh, with economics, analytics, research, and part of the CUNY TV family. Deborah Goldberg is the managing attorney for Earth Justice, and and uh, Stu Gruskin is the former deputy is the former executive deputy commission the deputy executive commissioner of the Department of of, of the of the Department of Environmental Conservation at a time when a lot of the planning was done to get us to where we are today. Um, I always try to declare conflicts when I when I have them, and I do have somewhat of a conflict. I work in in my private life. Um, with a uh, group called Physician Scientists and Engineers for Healthy Energy, which has written the governor criticizing um, some of the provisions of the SGEIS in the area of the engineering capabilities of upstate water filtration plants and the fact that there's no health assessment done uh, or an adequate health assessment done as uh, part of the SGEIS. Uh, Stu, I'm going to start with you. You were there kind of at the beginning of this. Set this up. How, how did we get to where we are today? Uh, okay, well, first, thanks for inviting me to participate tonight. I'm happy to be here. And really to explain where we're at today, you have to go back to uh, the springtime of 2008. Natural gas uh, was about 10 and a half or 11 dollars at that point. Today it's two dollars and fifty cents. So there, there was uh, a real gas rush at that point. Um, at DEC, which is the state regulatory agency, that has jurisdiction over issuing permits for oil and gas drilling, we knew that we were going to have to someday deal with this issue. It was playing out in other states around the country, but it was really the spring of 2008 when, when farmers in upstate New York were uh, getting people knocking on the door saying, you can be a millionaire overnight if you sign this lease. So what we decided to do at that point was take a think first, drill later position. Uh, we decided to use the State Environmental Quality Review Act, the SECRA process, to uh, comprehensively evaluate, um, determine what the issues are, where the environmental risks were, what steps needed to be taken to mitigate those risks, and have all of that in place before permits were issued. And we wanted to do it in a very 
transparent way. We wanted to involve the public. Uh, so first we did a scoping exercise where we invited people to tell us what they thought should be covered by this. Uh, then we issued a first draft of the, the SGIS as the operative document. I, I conducted public hearings throughout the state on the SGIS. We took comments on it. At that time, we got about 13,000 comments. DC spent the next year and a half or so going through those comments, did a revised draft. That came out this past summer. Uh, it was put out for public comment, and uh, there were about 60,000 comments for that. So this is a very controversial issue. New York's perspective has been, let's figure it out before there's drilling. Now, why is it so controversial? It's the intersection of environmental protection issues, economic development, and energy. From an environmental protection standpoint, there's no question that there can be very serious adverse environmental consequences to this process. As a regulator, I will tell you that I am convinced that the same way that uh, we have successfully regulated many industrial processes, we can successfully regulate this industrial process, but it's got to be done right. From an economic development standpoint, it will create jobs. It will create wealth for people. It will have all kinds of ancillary economic ripples, which if you've been to upstate recently, you'll know is sorely needed in a lot of these areas. And finally, there are the energy security implications. What can the U.S. do with a vast supply of domestic natural gas? Uh, and the energy experts have all kinds of, of theories about how that could be used. So you get all of these things intersecting, and it leads to a, a very vigorous public debate, and that's what we've been seeing. Deborah, let me ask you, from, uh, from, Earth, from Earth Justice's point of view, what are the environmental concerns connected to uh, hydrofracking? Well, there are a very wide array of environmental concerns, and if you take a look at the document that was produced by the DEC um, examining that, you'll see that there are, you know, about a dozen different um, chapters about water and air and land use and uh, landscape impacts and community impacts. Um, and, uh, but I think probably the ones that we have been seeing have been most serious so far relate to the wastewater that is produced. That's one of the issues. The flowback, what's called the, the flowback. The flowback, mm -hmm. right. Um, that was, uh, that one is one of the first issues we saw in Pennsylvania. Air quality issues, um, which tend to emerge when there is intensive drilling. And then there are, you know, even if everything were regulated perfectly, um, you have absolutely inescapable and actually, um, Irre sort of irreversible landscape impacts. Um, and those are probably the three that I would name as the most con serious right now. Mike, um, one of the first things that, that Governor Cuomo did, I believe Governor Cuomo did it, was to, it was to exempt the watersheds of New York City and Syracuse from areas where hydrofracking could take place. And the reason given was because we don't filter our water. You know, everybody else, everybody else upstate has puts their stuff through water filtration systems. We don't. I mean, how have, how has how has the news looked at the issue? No, well, we've put the the water first. I mean, uh, the drinking water, um, the uh, unfiltered water from New York City. Uh, Ninety percent of it's unfiltered. There's ten percent is process of becoming filtered. It was supposed to cost a billion dollars to filter it. Maybe it's going to be four billion. The other 90% uh, of the water to filter that would maybe be $30 billion, $40 billion. Um, so New York City is almost unique in the country in having an exemption from the federal government having to filter its water. So the water that everyone in New York City plus another million people in Westchester drink is unfiltered. And to um, adversely affect that, either to build a filtration plant or to at all harm the water or the water supplies or the water conduits, wouldn't be worth it if it created, you know, 100,000 jobs because the, the viability of a city in Westchester could be impacted. One of the issues, just I'll come to you in a second, Mark, is the idea of the setback. How far from... Uh, from well, the, the, I mean, people who are watching this, who, who live in the city, um, um, your water is regulated by the city of New York. And the city water regulators said they want a seven-mile um, zone. Right. Seven mile zone from this activity, from this drilling and these, uh, these pipes that are going to be uh, dealing with this um, uh, extraction. And the state said, uh, we'll give you a thousand feet. And so New York City said, well, we'd actually want seven miles. We want 35,000 feet instead of 1,000. 
And so when they came back, they kind of did a compromise in certain areas. The city will get its seven miles exclusion. In other areas, it's going to be two miles. Um, but as uh, the first speaker mentioned, when this discussion started, the MCF, which is how gas is measured, the, the price of gas was $12, $13. Now it's $2.50. Um, it's not worth it economically at that price. I think gas has to be at least 4 or $5 for people to go in and to build the, the infrastructure, to extract it, to move it out. Um, so this debate might have been settled for now because the market has dropped the price of gas for two reasons. It's been a warm winter. Um, and also, there is a lot of it. There's a lot of gas um, in this country, which is good, um, but it doesn't promote the drilling for more. So the debate will continue. Um, from, an, from an economic point of view, the, the, the price of gas, you know, obviously you want to have a steady supply of gas. So, I mean, if the production of gas is going to go up and down with, if, you know, if supply and demand is going to uh, not produce the gas. How do you know? I mean, how do you how do you factor that all together? We see the same thing happening in the oil industry. I mean, oil is as we're sitting here about 115 dollars a barrel, means there's more drilling for oil, and in fact, indeed, we are become we have become a net exporter of oil of petroleum products in this country, partly because of our drilling strategy and the exploration strategy that the Obama administration has adopted. Forget drill, baby, drill. I mean, that's not that <laughs> didn't don't go there, but. A, it is clear. I mean, a DEC study said this: the allowing fracking would would create anywhere from 15 to 53,000 jobs, directly and indirectly, in an area of the state where the major industry is prisons, and prisons that the state is closing. I mean, this is an economic boon to the to the southern tier of New York. Uh, they've seen it from from increased commerce from across the border in Pennsylvania where there has been fracking and where workers come in from all over the country and in fact are coming into New York to spend the money they make while working in Pennsylvania. Will there be, are there risks? Absolutely. Nothing is safe. You get on a plane, it's a risk. But does that, does that mean you don't get onto an airplane? It, of course it doesn't. This, fracking is probably not the answer to all of our energy concerns but it helps us get from here to there as we try to become more and more self-sufficient, moving whether we do to solar or, or wind or other forms of energy. Or nuclear. Where, or nuclear. Where, where, you have, where you have the governor, even as he's promoting natural gas, wants to shut down or not reauthorize the uh, Indian Point nuclear power plant. I when, think, though, just to, okay. just to wrap up, we have to look. This is a, almost a classic economic case of, the, of risks and rewards or cost-benefit analysis. There is a cost to this, but I think the benefit far outweighs it. But, uh, but there's a cost economically? You're talking about there's a cost environmentally. In, cost environmentally, but I think that can be resolved. I th you know, it's, I'm not saying we can make it completely safe. Will it, or is it likely that there will be accidents? The incident, the likelihood of an accident is probably there, although num numbers from the Pennsylvania experience show that severe accidents are, are minimal, but I learned, and you learned as a newspaper, in my past life as a reporter, and you, we learned never to say only one person died in the fire. Mm -hmm. um, so one accident is clearly too many. Good, you were gonna, um, um, oh. when you started out this process, how much of your, I mean, your thinking was driven in part by the price of gas. How does that change this whole Actually, process? Actually, I, I will say that our thinking really wasn't driven by the price of gas. We were, we, we had to act at that point in time because as a result of the price of gas, there was all of a sudden <coughs> applications were being made for people to start doing this in New York State. So we had to decide how to deal with those applications. But I will say that from an environmental regulator's perspective, the number of jobs that are going to be created or the energy policy issues really don't drive the decision making. And they shouldn't drive the decision making. It's very easy to set up this kind of, of issue as one of balancing, saying, well, we have to balance the environmental protections with the economic benefits and the energy impacts. Um, I, I actually don't think that there's that, that conflict. And I certainly would never accept the premise that we should surrender the environment to job creation, but basically because it's not necessary to do that. We have, you know, we're, we, we don't have to throw our hands in the air 
and say, oh, no, we're incapable of, of appropriately regulating this. There's nothing that mysterious about this technology. Uh, horizontal drilling has been used. Fracking has been used right now. Uh, I imagine many of you would be surprised to know we have about 13,000 active oil and gas wells in New York State, and most of them were, were drilled using fracking. Now, it wasn't the high-volume fracking, and that's why we did this study, to look at the, the differences. But these are technologies. It also was, it also was vertical fracking. It was, well, it, this is the high-volume high, high, high hydraulic fracking. And part of it is when you have is, to go underneath and then have to make a turn. It's a combination, it's technical change. It's a combination of horizontal drilling and fracking, which you know previously had been done independently. Once you put them together, you start getting the kinds of issues that Deborah mentioned. You have enormous water consumption and water handling issues and all these other issues. But the fact that just because there are issues doesn't mean those issues can't be resolved. And we do have the technology and we have the knowledge, we have the know-how to resolve them. We don't have to say, let's not address the environmental problems because we want to start employing more people. You, you actually can't subordinate one to the other. You have to have environment, energy, and economic development, in essence, be partners with each other. And then this will be successful in New York State and other places. One of the uh, flowback issues, um, and again, this is where my conflict came in, one of the letters that they wrote is the argument was that you exempted um, New York City and Syracuse from those watersheds because they were not filtered but in fact, water filtration systems, as these, these, this group of engineers I worked with, wrote to the governor and said the existing municipal water filtration systems upstate are not designed to handle the kind of chemicals in the yeah. flowback. And honestly, I think that's a misunderstanding okay, of yeah. what this is all about. Um, the, 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 the filtration we're talking about is designed to eliminate basically sediment, turbidity in the water. And some pathogens. And right. Stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not designed to eliminate the, the chemicals, and it will not eliminate the chemicals. So th the real issue, from my perspective, is not, you know, whether or not you distinguish between, you know, the, the areas where that are protected by the filtration avoidance determination and other areas, but you look at the, the, at, the, at the problems that all of them will face if there's hydraulic fracturing. And the flowback issue is, is not an issue that's related to the filtration. Um, the flowback issue is an issue that's related to what kind of wastewater treatment facilities do we have to handle all of this. That's what I meant, water. Right. Dirty water. Right. Right. And the, you know, this is you know, extremely toxic um, w wastewater. It's, it, it's toxic because of what goes into it, but it's even more toxic because of what it picks up when it's down below. So you have you know, heavy metals, you have hydrocarbons, you have in some cases elevated levels of radioactivity, and you have very high levels of salts. And um, all of these obviously affect the quality of people's drinking water or the water they're using to irrigate their crops or to feed their dairy cows or whatever they may be. And here in New York State, we do not have the facilities to deal with that. And they really didn't have them in Pennsylvania either when all of this was happening. So I would hope that we would get to a point where we actually have the regula stru regulatory structures and the technologies in place to deal with this. But we don't have it now. That's for sure. And so what's happening right now with most of the wastewater in Pennsylvania is that some of it, you know, a certain percentage of the flow back gets recycled and reused, but ultimately it cannot be reused and it has to be disposed of. And it basically gets trucked to Ohio. To Ohio for underground injection. Here in, in, in New York State, we don't even have the, the centralized industrial wastewater treatment plants that they have in Pennsylvania that are currently serving principally as recycling facilities. So, you know, we are talking about generating literally millions, billions of gallons of wastewater, and we don't have any plan for what's going to happen to it. Well, actually, the, the, the way the approach that the state took with that was really to put the burden on industry and say before you can get a permit, you need to have that plan. Uh, and DEC from the start, back in 2009, recognized that there were all kinds of, of substances, not just the chemicals used, but also the naturally occurring radio, radioactive materials and the brines and so on that needed to be disposed of. And we put in place a proposed requirement that what we figured was going to drive the industry and drive technology. And there's nothing wrong with environmental regulation driving technology, and industry has, in fact, uh, stepped up to that challenge. And originally, we thought that there was going to be a very high percentage of flowback from these wells. And it turns out that, that it's, it's a lower amount, and a lot of that is being recycled. But there still is a waste disposal issue. And DEC has made it clear that no permits are going to be issued in New York State until 
there's a solution to that waste disposal problem. Uh, and, and this it is should a, be resolvable. And this is a clear example of the value of a public-private partnership. You yes. know, we get industry involved in it, both on the regular, and when we were talking before we came on, on air about the idea of industry not fighting regulation, but of, on embracing it, and I think that, that can make something like this work. But we're not seeing that. Um, you know, every time there's new regulations proposed, what we see is very strong resistance to additional safeguards. If they're at the federal level, they say that states should do it. If they're at the state level, they're, they're, they're fighting in the legislatures. So I, I think that, you know, ideally that's what we would like to see, a lot more collaborative activity that would actually res potentially resolve this. But I've sat on panels with members of industry who actually have in place some of these best practices. You know, they are doing the recycling. They are using closed loop systems so you're not having these big wastewater impoundments that are volatilizing toxic chemicals into the air. And when I ask them point blank, you're doing it. You have an economic advantage. If it were regulated and everybody were required to do it, would you support regulations that would actually impose this across the board so everybody would rise to the highest standards? and they won't do it. Well, in fact, while there's, um, you know, most of the attention has been on environmental objections, uh, the Independent Oil and Gas Association has objected by arguing that the regulations are too, are too restrictive. So, I mean, that's, right. uh, so you do have the kind of both, uh, both sides of the yeah, spotlight. I mean, I think that, you know, the debate is kind of postponed for now because if they were to say, okay, the uh, tomorrow, here are the regulations, you can start drilling. No one would come to drill because it's not worth it at 250. Um, and um, I was speaking to someone involved in this, and he says, Yeah, we, wanted, we were running around New York and, and running to farmers and you know, uh, buying up leases. And, and the money is not from the leases, the money is going to be from the royalties. When the, the gas comes out of the ground, New York State has imposed 12.5% minimum, but of course it can go higher. So, all these riches, you said DEC responded to people saying, well, these Texans came, they want to drill here. Can they drill here? I say, well, let's look at it. Now it's 2012. They're still looking. Meanwhile, the, the leases are expiring. Um, you, can, you have to do you know, some activity to, to keep the lease going. But it's, if the price goes to $12, then there's going to be more pressure, um, to, to use a phrase, to drill, more interest, and the price goes down, there's less interest. And on the environmental side, for years, gas was the favorite thing of the environmental crowd. Gas is cleaner, it's much better than coal, you have to cut off mountains, and it burns cleaner. Um, but that's when gas was maybe competitive with renewables, which were getting subsidies. Now gas is very cheap, um, it's not Renewables are not competitive with it, with solar or wind or something like that. So now gas is not as favored on the environmental side as it was compared to coal. Um, one thing I know is that this stuff under New York State is still going to be there. And if New York does nothing now, it's going to be there in five years. It's going to be there in 10 years. It's going to be there in 100 years. It's been there for millions of years. And it's going to stay there as a commodity. It's not leaving. So um, when the price gets high enough and the technology gets good enough, um, it will come out. I, I don't think there's any basis, though, for New York to be suspending its review because prices are low. No, I'm not just saying it's right. suspending its review, but like it, the, it, the it, economic it realities been, have yeah. overtaken the governmental process. Well, not. I, I don't. I, I will tell you that the economic realities have actually not influenced the governmental process at all. The reason saying it's taking this long. Saying if tomorrow, no one's going to want to drill. But that, from DEC's perspective, that doesn't really matter because DEC has a statutory obligation to be regulating this, right. and the professional staff is doing the job that it should be doing. And whether people decide they want to drill or not want to drill, New York needs to have the kind of protections in place that will, will work uh, at whatever point in time. And there are a lot of factors that are going to potentially influence the price of gas. Uh, you know, new markets opening up as coal plants uh, close down. Right, which they they need to do. There are a lot of old, dirty coal plant coal plants. There'll be natural gas. There's well, a lot of discussion about natural yeah. gas for transportation. You know, there's or or exporting it. So well, well, also the whole if if the Middle East blows up even more, driving the price of oil way up, it would presumably make gas. Well, you well, have to look I mean, at what it's used for yeah. because oil is used for transportation. Mm -hmm. 
primarily. Put it in cars and trucks. Right, only 1% of all the oil. But just as the, the natural gas will be there five years, 10 years, 100 years from now, we can also look forward to improvement in technology. I don't know what, none of us here know what that will be, which may make the process safer, cleaner, satisfy Deborah's concerns, satisfy all of our environmental concerns. Shouldn't well, make you I would the, just say the that in the long term, I mean, here. one thing that we haven't talked about at all are climate impacts. You know, you alluded <coughs> to them a little bit when you talked about gas burning cleaner than coal, and it certainly does emit fewer pollutants into the air of the sort that are going to affect people's health. But the more that we are learning about methane leakage and both from the actual fracking process and from the transportation process, the less it looks like it's going to be a really substantially better solution from a climate perspective. And so one of the things that we really need to talk about, and this is something that will affect um, New York State, even if there isn't any well drilling, is the transportation and trying to make sure that we uh, eliminate the fugitive emissions that are um, you know, really part of this process right now. Well, the southern tier is hooked up to a to a pipeline system. I mean, right. you've got to build the capillaries to... Well, no, but, but that's, well, it's that's a little bit of a different issue. There's a, yeah. there's a debate going on right now. There are, there are battling professors <laughs> at Cornell. <laughs> who some of one, one group is saying that so much methane escapes just sort of inherently during the process that it really eliminates any kind of climate change benefits that natural gas would have. I went to a ceremony at Cornell when they closed down their coal burning boiler, it looked like something out of Dickens that they were using to heat the place. And I got accosted by people saying that it would be better for them to keep burning coal if the gas that was going to be burnt in their new uh, facility was going to come from Marcella Shale drilling. It took me a little by surprise, but these professors were arguing that so much gas escapes that it undermines any benefits. Now, there are other professors who say exactly the opposite. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you that I disagree with you yeah. <laughs> because well, from what I've read, I, I do think that, that it's at a level that's, that's low enough that it really doesn't. And it's in the gas company's interest to capture all of it anyway. They do product. green mm -hmm. completions, yeah. and it's, it's a solvable problem. There's no question well, about that. Well, that, that is the most important thing. I mean, there's a new study out from NOAA, as you may know, that w which is not just estimates, which is what all these other studies have been based upon about fugitive emissions from pipelines. It's an actual measurements of the emissions that are, are, are in, a, in the well field in, uh, in Colorado. And they're higher, actually, than the Howarth report suggested. Right. But again, the, the important thing is that there are ways to capture a lot of this, but right now they are not in place. I, I'm sure you've read the criticisms of that NOAA study also. So it's, again, this is... I have Trump your study with my not, study. Well, that's exactly <laughs> what's happening. Right. But, and in a well, way, it obscures the real... Now. Right, but it does obscure <laughs> the, the issue in a way because people get into the debate over whose study is better when, when really what we need, to be honest with you, is what we need is we need an energy policy. Yeah. And we really don't have an energy policy. Right. And, you know, we, we can talk about, yes, we support renewals, renewables here, and we don't want Indian Point, but we don't want coal, and what are we going to do with all the natural gas? We need to be making decisions on those issues. Well, part of that is linked into the governmental, I mean, the political. Um, you know, Andrew Cuomo ran for governor saying, I want to shut down Indian Point, which provides 25% of the power to New York City. He didn't say where the, that new 25% was going to come from, windmills or... You know, we're going to have solar panels out in Queens or something like that. Um, that the political process, the, the 60,000 comments or 60 right. million comments, whatever it was that came in, um, a lot of the anti, there's a video, out, a film called Gasland, and it shows people turning on a faucet in Pennsylvania and the water catches on fire. And that does not, happen. Not because of fracking, I, by the way. I, Th that's For other reasons, it does catch on fire, however. Okay. It do water sometimes does catch on fire, okay? Because of drilling. That's water right. catches on fire. Or, or, or pollution. naturally occurring methane. Right. No. Well, what, which is trying to the say river is that there's a picture of water ca coming on fire, okay? And people see that and they say, I don't want my water catching on fire, no fracking. Now, was that one due to fracking? Was that due to naturally occurring gas? In the water system, without due to something else, um, so the the part of the anti is no no fracking. The people accosting you up at Cornell or or people in New York City who are very agitated about this, even though the impact here is not you're not going to feel the environmental impact here that you are going to in the southern tier. 
people there are saying, I want these jobs, I want this money. So it's become a political battle, and the regulators are reflecting that, and they have to sift through all those comments which were generated by this debate. Can I just say one thing about the upstate economy and whether the people there really want this? Because I want to ask you about the also. The, yeah. Some do. Talk some about don't. that and talk about the lawsuit that you were involved in as well. Yeah, there, you know, there's there's a real split, I would say, and and you know, within people who among people who are who live in the southern tier and in, in this area, and you know, Andrew Cuomo had um, a, a variety of these regional economic development groups put together, and many of them in the area where there's going to be Marcellus Shell development. When they developed their plans, forward-looking plans for economic development, they did not include natural gas as part of what they see as their, their you know, economy's future. And I think that a lot of the resistance here is um, in part due to the fact that this is a, an industry that operates on a real boom and bust cycle. So you do get you know, a lot of money that comes in in the, in the gas rush stage, um, a lot of jobs that are very often people from out of state, a lot of money goes to Texas and Oklahoma. A lot of money does go to people who have large plots of land that they can lease. And there are people in the communities who are running, you know, restaurants and hotels and so forth that are also getting revenues from the people there. But there, it, it, is, it is very much a boom and a bust cycle. And what the studies have, that have looked at this long term show is that the, this is an industry that pushes out a lot of the sustainable industries on which people are currently relying. They push out the agriculture, they push out the tourism and recreation, so that by the time they actually leave, after the boom is over and the, 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 the bust sets in, many of these towns are worse off than they were when they started. And there are a lot of very serious social problems and economic problems that come even with the boom. So for example, in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and some of these areas in the northeastern part of Pennsylvania where they are doing a lot of drilling, they are for the first time seeing homelessness in their areas because the rents have gone up so high from all this influx of new workers that people who've lived there long term can no longer afford um, to stay in the places where they've grown up their whole lives. Well, to be fair, the DEC study looked at that as well, looked at the social cost of the of fracking and the cost on well, cost of barely. actually, yeah, I would <laughs> the, the, that part of it happened after I, I left DEC, okay. and I think the study focused a little more on the benefits than on the cost. But there is a solution to the problem that Deborah is saying. You know, we've been talking about the environmental issues. There's a whole other set of of issues that have to do with planning, and New York actually is in a good spot here because there's a window of opportunity to address some of those those issues that are inherent in this industry. I reject the argument that we shouldn't, we shouldn't take advantage of the boom because there may, there's going to be a bust afterwards. I would say let's do what we can to maximize the boom and do the planning that we need to do to mitigate or minimize the bust while we have the window of opportunity to do that. And unfortunately in New York State and I think in a lot of other states there really isn't that sort of planning capacity but there are some studies going on now and there's the advisory committee in New York that's supposed to look at this kind of stuff. And hopefully New York will, in fact, um, you know, take a look, a good look at those issues. But, you know, when you talk about the divided communities, I've met many times with the landowners, and I can tell you that the most passionate voices for environmental protection are also the most passionate voices for allowing drilling. Because for a lot of the farmers that I've spoken to, the only way that they're going to be able to afford a new tractor that they need in order to farm their land is if they're able to do a gas lease. So the question is, is there a way to accommodate and, and reach an agreement that people are not going to have that fear, that people are going to be confident that government is going to do the right job, that people are not going to accept environmental devastation at, at the, as the price of having some economic prosperity. Let me um, just, oh, I want to go to questions, but let me uh, you talked about the divisions upstate between uh, I've, I saw one story which, which talked about that there were people who will benefit and their neighbors will have to pay the price. People who do not want to go, who did not want to sign leases on their land. You also were involved in lawsuits involving two, there were two, there were two, there were two towns. So far there have been decisions in which those towns use their zoning mm -hmm. power to say we don't want any, any, any permits, any leasing of uh, gas for uh, gas wells within our community and the state says well that's not really it's kind of a misuse of the zoning power but the uh, judges 
ruled with the towns. Right. Well, the state didn't take a position in these cases. Yeah, the state chickened yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, this was really a, a, a battle between the towns and the industry, and the in one case, and the towns and a landowner who was represented by the same lawyers, basically, as the industry, and there was very close coordination there. But um, there, there have been many, many towns in New York, actually, who have now taken action of various different kinds. Some of them have tried to zone it out completely. Some of them just want to restrict how it's operating in their town, where it's operating in their town. They don't want a gas well that's within 100 feet of a person's house, which is what's legal right now in New York. Um, and there's some that have just put temporary moratoria in place because they would like to actually see this process play itself out before they make a decision whether or not this is something that they really want to have to come to their communities. And, it, and there definitely are some very um, interesting legal issues involved. Um, it, it's a question of whether or not the state has control, not only of the technical aspects of the operations and the activities of the industry, but also of the land use, you know, where, you know, sort of the state wants to regulate how it's done, and most people recognize that it is entirely appropriate, and that's where the regulatory authority should stay. Where it's done, a lot of the localities feel like they are they know much better what their communities are, you know, what the character that they want to protect, whether or not they want to be a rural small town or whether they want to be a big industrial zone. Mm -hmm. And there's very big differences of opinion with even within you know the southern tier about you know about that question. Yes, ma'am. Tell us tell us your name and your campus, please. Oh, hi. Uh, my name is Violeta Mosheva. I'm from Brooklyn College. Uh, my question is for Mr. Gruskin from yeah. the DEC. Um, Formerly of DEC. So he's, right. so he's, allowed, to, he's right. allowed to speak his mind. I'm unconstrained. Now. He escaped. Yes. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> since you were there before, maybe you can um, help answer this. Um, the DEC regulation that would be um, put forth if, say, hydrofracking is allowed, um, would the regulation um, mandate the right. industry to release the chemicals they used? in the process of extracting the gas, uh, because up to now they haven't been fully transparent with what they're using and how much Very of it good. Is, is being Very used. Very good oh. question. Yeah, I, I will tell you that that historically industry has not disclosed the composition of the frac fluids. Uh, we made it clear actually back in 2008 that if this was going to be done in New York State, there'd have to be full disclosure of, of what's used. Uh, there's, there's always gonna be a legal issue about whether there's any proprietary aspect so that while it would be disclosed to the government, not necessarily disclosed to the public, but I will say that by this point, industry has really come around and realized that this is an issue, that they're just shooting themselves in the foot, and they, they have started to make voluntary disclosure in other places, but this falls into the category of what Deborah was saying before, where then when you say to industry, well, how about, you know, accepting a requirement that it be disclosed, they balk it. At that, but I, I don't think certainly not in New York, and I think in other places that that the disclosure issue is is actually an issue that's pretty much off the table at this point. Off the table in the sense that it won't go forward absent. It disclosing. will be right. There's going to be disclosure. I, I would just like to add one thing, though. There, this is an area that is very rapidly changing. Um, uh, New York did disclose uh, a certain amount to the public, and it got a certain kind of information from the industry. But since uh, the New York's policy was put in place, and even you know since their proposed regulations were drafted, um, there have been other places that have adopted much better laws. And so right now, I would say that New York is really behind the curve on disclosure, and that if you really want to have a state-of-the-art disclosure provision that is going to take care of the confidential business information, but give the public the maximum amount of information available, then there's a lot that needs to be done to improve the regulations. Right. I think the, the, the concept, though, the public policy, mm -hmm. is that there should be disclosure. Absolutely. And, and let me ask one, exactly let me ask one yeah. I don't know who to ask this question. This is just for a very brief answer. Are we talking about an industry which has an Exxon Mobil, or are we talking about yeah. Wildcat, or yes. a lot of no. smaller companies? What are we, at this what are point, we talking in about? doing the fracking, it's going to be mostly the bigger companies. It's Halliburton. Yeah. Well, well, as a servicer, I mean, the right. the, the drillers, the right? You have a company like Chesapeake, mm -hmm. which in turn um, enters into contracts with Halliburton and Schlumberger and these other companies to uh, to do the the fracking and. In other words, so but on. are smaller companies coming in trying to get the leases and then they. Go, There's a lot of really. consolidation in the industry yeah. right now, right? Actually, and it's very expensive yeah. to drill one of these wells. It's not right. like the old days where you could, you know, stick a pipe in the ground and hope something comes up. Right. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Nicholas, and I'm from Brooklyn College. 
My question is also for Mr. Greskin. Um, what are the num numbers on flowback and accidents caused by fracking? You mentioned there were some numbers. I didn't catch actual numbers, though. Well, the, the, the last that, that I heard, and I'll just, I'll just speak in sort of a range, is that um, it, it varies depending upon the underlying geology and so on, but it could be anywhere from 15% to, say, 30% of the fluids that go in coming back out. Maybe in some cases it's more. Do you know offhand, Deborah? It varies a lot with the formation, but yeah. out in the, in the Northeast, it's been between like 9 and 35 percent. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now, remember, we haven't done high-volume hydraulic fracturing in New York State yet. So uh, New York State's been relying on information that's been provided from other places. In terms of accidents, uh, you know, there's always going to be industrial accidents. There's always going to be human error. There's always going to be natural disasters. And really, the job of a regulator is to put in place a, a system that's going to try to plan for those. Um, I, I don't know. At some a point, the response. question is: Do you have you have to have some faith in technology in order to in order to survive well, in the modern age? I think some of the numbers from Pennsylvania were there. There were seven seven accidents per hundred wells, or something like that. Seven severe accidents. Blowouts. Well, that's actually quite high, isn't yes. it? Yes. <laughs> Um, I think it's like I think it's lower than that, but I mean the question is what counts as an accident, right? right? So um, you know it, there are spills all the time. There, what, what I mean I think that I, I started to talk about it and never got to talk about it a little bit was you know how the industry is coming to come to New York, notwithstanding the fact that the price is low, and that's through pipelines. And so a lot a lot of the damage that we're seeing, for example, in Pennsylvania right now, is because the development of of gathering lines and pipelines in, in Pennsylvania. Um, which are not really regulated there. There is no siting control. I mean, New York actually, we are really blessed. And you know, for all the critique that we have done of what DEC has do, ha, has done so far, um, we are so far beyond what Pennsylvania has done, and we are in so much better hands, in my view, in terms of the agency that's going to administer it than it, than people in Pennsylvania and Ohio are. Um, so, I mean, I'm really grateful to people like Stu and to DEC for all the hard work they've put into this. It really is providing more baseline scientific information about this industry than almost you can find almost anywhere else. Yes, ma'am. Tell us, I know your name, but tell us, but tell us your name and, and why you're joining us. Uh, my name is Nancy Schmidt, and I'm a resident here in New York City. I'm also a member of IOGA, which is the Independent Oil and Gas Association, mostly because I have a lot of industry experience. Um, and the question I'd like to ask the panel has to do with the role of ad valorem severance and royalty um, as it can work to ameliorate the boom and bust cycle that's been described. Um, and um, I, I think... You know, the other question that I, that I would like to put out there has to do with um, the estimates of environmental costs that have been made uh, against the uh, Marcellus well experience in Pennsylvania, which actually pr on a per well basis are very low. It's about $4,500 versus a $2.8 million benefit per well. So, you know, I think uh, it's just a question about uh, sizing up the risk and then also the role of taxes uh, in terms of the economic benefit and ameliorating the boom bust. Taxes linked to the actual production of the wells, what taxes we get out of it? Right, ad valorem, severance, and royalty. And I'm assuming that somebody on the panel is familiar with those three and the how they to work. smooth out the... Yeah, but I mean, do you have well, a... Yeah. I, I, I guess what I, I would say is that New York hasn't figured that out yet. Um, there's a, a, an advisory committee that was created exactly for that purpose. Look over um, there. But uh, we're, um, they don't have the answer. Uh, I think that as a matter of policy, uh, the, the governor's office has recognized that I industry has a responsibility to the communities and to the state, um, and that these are serious issues that need to be addressed. But as far as I know, there are no proposals on the table to address them. You were, you were talking about uh, the, uh, the royalties that, that we would get as the state. So, I mean, no, 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 the, 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 I, I own a piece okay. of land, right. and you, I guess you're not the driller, but you come to me, <laughs> and you say you want to rent my, my acre, and, you know, you're going to pay me this just as a lease, and, okay, that's fine, you have rights, but now when the extraction starts under New York regulations, I'm supposed to get at least 12.5% of that. Now, we can negotiate something higher, mm -hmm. um, but that's the floor. Right, and then there would be presumably, like, income tax revenues and various other right. kinds of things on that, 
And then the, because the, I'd be yeah. earning income as well as, right. as you'd be earning. And the severance tax, which is something that is, is now in place in virtually every state in the country that has oil and gas development except New York State, you know, would, would be a tax based on how much is pulled out of the ground. And it would be, anyway, this would require action by our legislature. Would it raise the value of the land for property tax purposes? Property taxes are really a separate thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, you know, the property taxes at this point, to a certain extent, can is the one of the few things that actually can be controlled by the localities, I understand, so but that they can actually get revenues to support the costs that they they right. incur. But I, I think it, it's just it's important to point out, though, that a revenue stream by itself doesn't solve the problem. Right. That that all of all of these um, potential sources of revenue can, in fact, be used in ways to mitigate the bust but it requires planning. And there have been studies that have been done in other states. In West Virginia, uh, a study was done maybe six or eight months ago that talked about their experience in trying to deal with the boom and bust and ideas for setting up uh, trust funds for the future to deal with the, the out years of this and other types of, mm -hmm. of planning. But fundamentally, but we have a, but money's but not enough. You but, need but we also have, too. Um, we have a number of things, the Environmental Protection Fund, where supposedly were dedicated to a purpose and get sucked into the general fund that they you know that, well that you know there are there are commitments uh, that don't get carried out from the very the promise, I, political I, as i mentioned uh, yeah. right from the very first day that new york was looking at this industry was knocking at the door saying we're prepared to pay a reasonable fee to deal with the inspectors and the permitting and the regulatory structure that would be required for this and i could not say to industry great pay the money and it will be used for that purpose the way the new york state government works is once money goes into the government, it's not necessarily spent on what it's supposed to be spent for. So that's another issue that would have to be dealt well, with. Well, it's also DEC has, what, 10 people who deal with this? And you need, <laughs> well, you need no, a, a, we have more, a, but we a, will. A thousand fold. It's, or, it's a very good issue. That, um, yeah. So, you know, New York does not have the, the human or the, um, the regulatory infrastructure to do this. Well, and, 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 it, and how and much would that cost? It's not in the, the governor's budget, and it's not in the well, governor's Well, the expectation budget. is this would right. come out of all of these these mm -hmm. riches flowing out of the ground, and it would fund that. So, and it, again, it goes back to the price is too low. You know, people aren't going to drill. We're not going to have the infrastructure. But to the other question that was raised is um, these numbers of you know it, it's a thousand fold of the uh, the the economic benefit versus the environmental cost. Um, you know. The numbers cited. Um, yes. So, yes, that is. If you do the math that way, you do come out. Let, let's let's do this. If you do the math the other way, well, the environmental cost is actually you know five million for every drill, um, and the economic impact is one million. Then then you don't do it. it it's, 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 it's a very simple. Yeah. Yeah. You suggested earlier yeah. this is not a question of that simple arithmetic. I mean, right. but there is, and he's not entirely wrong. Um, Thank goodness. <laughs> but, That's but, pretty good. For you. <laughs> yeah. You're not entirely wrong. Right. right. <laughs> but there, but we do have to balance this. I mean, and there are ways, there are mechanisms, and we've seen it in other instances. There are, we, there are mechanisms to protect against those, not only against the busts, but also against the environmental impact, at least creating some. And I know we, we just had this discussion about money doesn't always go where it's supposed to go. But if we were to create, if the if our legislator legislature were to be creative enough to manufacture or create a fund to deal with the disasters that will, I perhaps shouldn't call it disasters, but the accidents that will inevitably occur. We don't we don't know what the severity will be. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Guillermo Rodriguez. I go to Bronx Community College, and my question is: It looks like gas will go up to five dollars a gallon in the next month. Would hydrofracking in New York State possib possibly? impact energy independence gas Gasoline. in the yeah. yeah gas that's in your car is not what we're talking about gas so gas prices oil, that get very right. expensive right that's actually oil it, 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 those are liquid hydrocarbons but there has been discussion but, but if, we, if we go to compress natural, natural gas natural gas via right right, right. Well, but yeah I, and again i mean I, I, but that isn't what you're that's not what the five dollars is all about uh, there could be <coughs> excuse me an entirely new infrastructure created and you know, new demand created for gas if we went into compressed natural gas for vehicles. But <coughs> there's really serious issues, again, from a climate perspective, that we have to deal with before we're going to, we, we, before we should actually go down that road. I mean, there, there are fleets that are being converted today to liquefied natural gas or compressed natural gas. But think of it this way. 
Right now in the U.S. there's about 800 filling stations that you could fill your car with compressed natural gas and 175,000 conventional filling stations. So if, you can if we were going to, late at night. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we were going to, and, and I, I'm a big fan actually of, of the trying to use our domestic natural gas to address the energy security problem. But what that means is that we have to look at what we use the oil for. 70% of oil use in, in the U.S. is for transportation. So that means that we have to start addressing all of the issues uh, that arise when, when you're going to start converting uh, your transportation um, uh, fuels uh, off of oil to other alternatives, of which natural gas is one. There's Just a, converting the New York City buses isn't enough. Well, no, I mean, T, T. Boone Pickens, who's a yeah. Texas uh, oil and gas man, you know, has this plan, <laughs> and he's been running around the country um, uh, promoting it, that we would start setting up, you know, that um, the Postal Service or UPS or Federal Express or, or, or buses could go to a, a natural gas um, and come off of gasoline because we have, you know, huge reserves, Marcellus Shell and elsewhere, of natural gas as opposed to oil-based gasoline, which we're mostly importing. I mean, we're importing a lot. There of are other ways. I mean, UP you mentioned UPS. UPS has developed a computer program for its trucks, for its, the routes the trucks take to minimize left turns, because UPS has, cal has calculated that waiting to make a left turn burns more gas. The fact. That, let me just point out that the fact is that this is happening. If you go online and you look up. CNG for compressed natural gas, you'll find websites that actually list all of the fleets that have done this, and they're doing it not because it's good for the environment, which, by the way, it is, apart from the, the greenhouse gas issues, you, you get you know, less particulate matter. New York City may actually be able to comply with the Clean Air Act if all the vehicles in New York burn natural gas instead of gasoline. But, um, so it's, cool. it is being done for an, a commercial imperative, but it's, it's really just like playing around the edges when you look at the size of what needs to be done. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Merifel Pimentel, and I'm from John Jay College. My question is, uh, will hydrofracking become a major issue in the 2012 presidential race? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, the I president know. is, I mean, be, <laughs> I uh, uh, because, well, besides the fact that, you know. Um, I mean, Obama, as you said, uh, 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 Mr. Obama said it in his uh, State of the Union speech, he kind of hinted at it. And it's like, well, is he supporting it? Is he not supporting it? And both sides were kind well, of. I think it was, I mean, I think. Both sides. I don't think any way to look at it other than there was a support of. Well, but okay, it was support, you know, and, um, you know, at the. Uh, I'm not thrilled with that, at, but, I, but, you know, the reporter in me says, uh, I don't see just how recently, you, how you can't achieve Just it recently, the, uh, the head of the EPA, who works for Obama, um, said, you know, hydrofracking is coming and. and um, but I'm not sure the federal government needs she to regulate got the it. Memorandum. Right. Maybe maybe someone else is going to regulate it. Except the, the EPA is doing a study the, right now. The reason the reason I don't think it's going to be an issue is um, it's it's the price. Is is that um, the debate has subsided as the price has has, has dropped and um, you know when the price goes up and there'll, there'll be more of a demand to drill, then the debate will resume. I just it will the be price confused. Of, of gas is going. That's to, that's why the price of gasoline will be an issue. No, no, no in I, don't campaign, think, I don't think the, the price of will be gas. Is I going agree, to, right. but the issues will be confused. Can I, I, I have to disagree though, because I don't think the debate has subsided. What's happened with this? Well, you're issue, in the middle of it. That's why. Well, but <laughs> but I'll tell you that that this <laughs> has gone from really what started out as a technical regulatory. Um, mission on the in part of these it is a philosophical battle now and I think one of the things that anyone who's interested in this needs to really think about is to be precise and to be precise in trying to figure it out because there's an awful lot of misinformation that's been put out there by both sides by the pro fracking forces and by the anti fracking forces because fundamentally they view it as a battle of you know of, of yes or no and it really isn't quite like that. Okay? It is an industrial process that we can get some benefits from and that we have to address the issues very precisely to try to uh, mitigate. Yes, sir. I want to get one more question in. Hi. My name is McKinley McNair. I'm a graduate student at Brooklyn College. And my question is, uh, as being a resident from New York City, why should I be concerned with hydrofracking in New York uh, State? 
That's because all. it's exempted from the uh, from the New York City watershed. Well, I would say this is the first thing you brought to me. It's um, that the water you drink when you're going to Brooklyn College or living or working um, or studying in the five boroughs um, comes from upstate. And if that water is impacted, that water system is impacted, your life will change um, because the city will not survive as we know it unless it has its water system. And going to the cost, if the cost, if they did hydrofracking and the New York City watershed was in, impacted, and then we had to filter that. We'd have to build a $30 billion filtration plant. Or um, there's uh, seismic tremors, which could crack one of the pipes. Well, that pipe has been there for 100 years, and it's the only place we get our water from. We're, you know, um, upstate and in Pennsylvania, well, if they hurt the water in the area, they truck in water. You can't truck in water for 8 million people. But, it, but it's, so strictly, that, that's why it's strictly an economic issue, though, for New York City. It's not a question of the safety of the water. It's not an issue that the water is going to get contaminated. It's a question that New York City is going to lose its exemption because the rural character of the area is going to change. Right. And, and whether it's through gas drilling or shopping center development or casinos, that's the danger. So it means the people in New York City are going to have to pay for filtration. It doesn't mean the water is going to get poisoned. Do you think filtration is definitely coming? I think if filtration is coming, it's because of turbidity and the other issues that are much more immediate and significant threats than hydrofracking. Well, we've gone That's from the next show. We've gone <laughs> from, and they're there. We've gone from Saudi Arabia to the Gowanus Canal. We're about to get the uh, our time is about up. We're about to get the goodbye. I always make deadline. I want to thank you all. This is a very it's a very spirited discussion. We'll see you all next time on CUNY Forum. Thank you.